You ever heard of the expression, bag job? Do you know why they call it a bag job? Because it sure as heck isn't my lunch. Let's go find out why we got this 87 lever gun de uh, delivered to us in a bag. And it's down the rabbit hole once again, boys and girls. <laughs> You know, we're getting good at, at, at unbagging stuff. Let me tell you something about this bag. Don't throw this bag away. Leave it on the bench until you're done because we don't know if there's a screw or something mud catting up in the bottom of that. We really don't know that, all right? Uh, let's see, piece of wood, piece of wood. Oh my God, this thing is filthy. So what I think happened here was somebody attempted to take this apart and then realized, oh yeah, it's nasty. I'm gonna pay the guy over there to uh, go do it. Oh, good Lord. I don't know if you can even see the mung loading on. Good God, look at that. Watch this. Watch this. Ugh. All right. So step one in, um, in a true conservation, the first thing we do is we're going to boil all this stuff. And when we boil it, we're going to get all this just dried on. Look at, look at that scuzz. Wow. So we'll get all that mess off of it, take the rest of the gun apart, and then we'll, um, we'll go ahead and hang in a pot and boil it and uh, get going with that. So the next thing we're gonna do here is try to take the rest of the gun apart because I think, I hope all the stuff is here. I really do. I've never had one of these apart. I've never even been in the room with one of these things until about five minutes ago. Yeah, I'll do this, this should be quick. And every time I get told that, I wind up playing tetherball with myself. Well, this is an unusual setup here. And the reason why I like clamping stuff in this, in this whoops, bump, sorry in this fuzz, it's fine, Wait a minute. is that I can rotate the barrel and look at this all the way around and figure out what I want to do. That may not be a, a correct pin. I'm going to just figure out. So what it looks like is this clamp is going to come undone and it's going to slide forward. What's really, really cool is, is you can look at these guns from 100 and what, uh, 78, 130, 140 years ago and see the beginnings of all of the stuff that you work on now, you look back and you go, well, this just looks like an 870. No, it kind of looks like a Model 12, but it's, and it's a Winchester. But no, this is what the Model 12 came from, not the other way around. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like looking at a, um, um, the RSC-17 and going, golly, this looks an awful lot like a Garand. Mm, kind, of, kind of the other way around. All right, so I got that screw out. And then I'm guessing that with a little bit of nice light massaging, and you guys are going to hear drawers and stuff coming open and shut behind me because uh, Jared and Casey are, are busy uh, um, finishing up on one of those black things that, you know, I don't like to work on, but they do, and that's fine. There's this misconception that I do not allow black rifles to be worked on in this shop, and nothing can be further from the truth. If that's how they want to screw it up, <laughs> so be it. Okay, so let's see here. We've got to select a screwdriver that'll fit. That is just the right width, and that's perfect. So then, what I like to do on old screws, that's just a tad too wide. Let's get one that's a little bit narrower. Same width, a little bit narrower, right there. I like to lay that in there. Ah, hang on a second. You're gonna hear a grinder running as I walk across the room, and what I'm doing is modifying the screwdriver bit to be just a wee bit narrower. Screwdriver bits are cheap. Historical screws are expensive. So I lay it up in there like that. There's no way for you to see it. But I lay it up in there and tap on it to drive it all the way to the bottom of the slot. When you're doing that, that means you've got a good bite on the head. The reason why I cut it a little bit narrower was if the screwdriver slot is too wide, it'll dig into the metal and you don't want it to dig into the metal. There's another one on the other side. We will rotate. Ooh, look at that. Now, let's take a quiz out there. What's going to happen when I pull this screw out? Okay, what's going to happen? Now, well, we thought it was going to take off. Oh, it would have took off, right? So um, don't do that or else pieces of this will come flying out, pop you in the eye socket. Really, just if you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. All right, we had skipped away there for a second. You see that little dent right there? 
there's a screw that passes through the the uh, underneath, and there's a dent there, and you got to watch. There's this tendency to want to go tapping things on and off. Yeah, let me pick that up a little bit. It, you got to watch for these detents. Winchester had this fabulous habit of running pins through things that intercepted other parts. Well, I'll just bang on this till it comes off. Yeah, you can do that, and you smear the pin all the way down the barrel. Okay, so we've removed the forward magazine tube support. We've removed the barrel clamp. Here's the barrel clamp right there. And you see this nice dark layer of rust on it. Resist the temptation to wire wheel that black layer of dust off because what I'm about to show you is amazing. And I picked this gun specifically to demonstrate what I'm talking about a full conservation because we've done these before, but we haven't done really good before and afters on them. That's fine. It's fine. I'll work around it. Um, and I'm rolling this around now to show you the rust loading on the outside of this. But this rust is a really fine, thick layer. And that thick layer, unlike up here underneath the handguard where it's been scrubbed off, this has been scrubbed off. You can see the steel wool marks. Hang on a minute. Let me turn out of the light here and see if I can't get you right there. You can actually see all the, 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 the scrubbing marks where this has been just rubbed. Don't do that. That's what happens when you jump from cleaning to reset without going through conservation and refurb first. And that's my definition of a bubba. A bubba job is where you skip from cleaning to restoration or from cleaning to reset because it's not a restore, it's a destruction. Underneath all of this mong, you can actually see it here. There's a little bit of that blue right there. There is actually a pretty decent looking finish. So what I'm looking for now is, is, is this magazine tube brazed in and I'm looking for any kind of a fastener hiding underneath and I'm rolling around here and I'm showing you there's no fastener. So since I know that this magazine tube isn't moving and it's not just plugged in here and it's not held in, I'm going to assume that this is either brazed, threaded, or I'm not screwing with it. So we're going to do it all in one piece. We'll push the follower out the other end. You just heard it hit the floor over there. So now we're going to reset the camera angle, take the rear end off this thing. Typically, when you're looking at a butt plate screw that's been on the gun for a long time, the more screwed up one is on the top because the butt's been grounded. The less screwed up one is typically on the bottom. Now, you would think it's impossible to rust a screw into a piece of wood, and I'm here to tell you it is very possible because if this screw corrodes, the corroded material is always larger in diameter, and it, it I don't know how to tell you this, it'd be like throwing sand into gears. It, it glues itself into the stock. So. Once again, we're going to select the correct screw bit, and then I come in typically with a small pick and remove all this mung up inside this, this head here so that the screw bit goes all the way down in it. And there's a lot of mung coming up out of this. Right there, you can see this orange crap coming up out of this. And the thing you immediately see is how deep this is and how shallow this is because the entire top of the screw's been knocked off. So once again, we'll do an impact. And I'm going to go ahead and line the screw head up, and there you go, and I'm going to just tap on it and see if I can't get it up inside that head. And there is not a whole lot of slot left in here, so I'm going to have to hang on to it with my hand. Okay. We got lucky, and this one turned. Did you hear it break loose? So I got asked, why, why? The sex wax, and I'm going to tell you what, it's Mr. Zogs. It's, it's a surfboard uh, wax, and we keep a little bit of it on every bench because when these screws go back in, we're going to hit them. Plus, it's pretty cool to say I've got sex wax on my bench. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Okay, let's go after the other one. This screw looks good. Usually, I'll see them. They'll be orange all the way down. Hand cut screw. Look at that. Whew. This pig's old. All right, let's do the bottom one right quick. And we'll just kind of crack this thing loose. Okay, now you got to watch this stock because, okay, this thing came loose. All right. Now, why didn't that just fall off? Because this stock has what's called a widow's peak on it. Sorry. That's a widow's peak right there. And you got to watch when you drag that through. And you pull this apart. And there's old decayed rust up in there that it's been pitted. And it's orange. And you can see where it's been infilled, but this thing looks good. But here's the other thing I want you to see. Could you imagine what this weapon would look like if I was allowed to refinish the wood? 
<laughs> Typically on most Winchesters we found, never always start from the back and work your way forward removing screws. Because um, if you start at the fore and work your way back, you'll pop a mainspring, you'll do whatever the heck, and then you'll strip the crap out of everything. And then you got to send it to me. And I'm not cheap. All right, here we go. Good. This thing's coming apart. Nice. Nice. There we go. Let me go ahead and turn this off. Now, a quick point of note here, and I, I'm not sure that I'm going to let you guys know something to be dangerous. But okay, I got my all 16s back out. We call it an all 16s because it works on English and metric fasteners. So let's say we really wanted to bump this thing loose. I'm going to show you the setup here. I'll get out of the way. Trust me. Hang on a minute. There we go. So let's say we really wanted to put a little bit of butt on this thing. The beauty of these, these uh, magnet tip screwdrivers, uh, uh, I, I buy them from Brownells by the pound, um, is you can then put that around that, slide that down on there, push down with the palm of your hand, and rotate. Now, you see right down here where my finger is, down here, right there? Guess what happens if the screw breaks loose? Whoop, we get a divot in the stock. So as with all things, with great power come great responsibility. All right, let's pull the screw up, pull the stock off. Okay. All right, this bodes well. This, this, this gun is not fighting me. Okay, why am I standing here on a bench like this? Well, here's something I want to show you. Let's say, for instance, that this stock was stuck. Um, use what you've got. Don't beat on this thing with a hammer. You've got a four-pound hammer right here. So I'm using where the comb is, right where this comb rolls out. I'm trying to get a light on it, right there, where the comb line rolls out. And I'm just going to pop it on the desk, you see, and the action will keep moving. And the weight of the action will pull it free, and I don't have to beat on it, pry on it. And yeah, good Lord, look at what the hell's going on down inside there. Okay, buddy, now we're getting to the good stuff. Let's look at this. Oh, wow, hang on a minute, let me rewind that. Wow, we this thing looks like it got dropped in a river. See all that white stuff right there? That's either a bee's nest or it's the wax left over when WD-40 evaporates. I don't know. I'm going with the wax. We have a pot boiling here. It's an $8 Wally World stainless steel pot. And then we have a torpedo boiling. And the torpedo's got an electrical heater in it. This is our quick and dirty rig when we got to do one gun and get it out the door. We just roll it out the front door and plug it in. That's a standard water tube or water heater uh, um, element in the torpedo. You can fake this with about a five foot long piece of gutter laying on top of a gas burner. You get a gutter, you get two ends, you RT it, RTV it on. And when you're all done, when the RTV sets, you just put some water in it, throw it up on a gas ring and then set it in for a quick boil out. This does a really, really good job of removing cosmoline on, and uh, dry it on mung. And it also begins to convert that layer of rust and turn it into, into ferroferric oxide, which is bluing. We've covered this before, but I'm gonna cover it again because this was a unique gun and I just wanna give you the before and after on something and, and, and just beg you to not take a wire wheel or something right off the bat. We'll go, okay, so we've got a two and a half thousandths wheel hooked up here. And uh, Casey's taking this pile of scrub and buffing it out. And what we see on that is all of the That's all converted rust. That's ferroferric oxide. That's all black rust. And if we walk that off, and this wheel is really, really fine. If you can't put your finger in the wheel like that, your wheel's too sharp. Not the blades are too sharp. You can do this by hand with four ox steel wool. It can be done. But you remember that rust about piece of shit that was there that I begged you guys to not take a hardware wheel to? Look at that. No chemicals, nothing. All we did was convert that entire layer of surface model back down, take it off the top, and that's what that weapon looked like a long time ago. That is some sexy stuff right there.
to try to do some kind of before and after shot here. We've tried to set this back up again to show you how stunning this conservation process is and what was mud catting underneath all that rust and why I'm going to absolutely beg you guys to not just cut straight into a wire wheel when you want to take this rust off. As we can see, and by now I'm thinking that maybe Bruno will have figured out how to before and after you a couple of times here. And if you're not dizzy, hang with me. Um, as you can see up in this area, right up in here, you can see that it's white here. And on the before, they had just run the rust all the way off of it. But if you can see the color of the, uh, the blue here, how rich this turned out. And then a little bit of um, uh, steel wool on the wooden parts. And you wind up with a stunning look here. Go ahead and bring it over a little bit. It looks stunning when it's done. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of wax on it when I'm all the way done here. Oops, I dropped that screw, how inconvenient. Um, I'm only gonna need one to do this. So let me run this screw in and all of this was just boiled, no chemicals, no nothing. I mean, this, uh, this turned out looking pretty damn sexy here. Actually, I'm gonna need that screw because apparently that one is significantly longer than the other one. Yes, that's the problem right there. There we go. Okay, um, that little yellow bottle over there. Let me get this screwed in here and I'm gonna show you something. There is a, you guys are all accustomed to me using my, um, my toilet bowl ring wax formula. And that's great, but on, this was a civilian gun. And as you can see, it, it, um, it's a civilian gun and it actually looks pretty good here. This, uh, this wax that I'm using, it's a feeding wax. And when you put this feeding wax in this and you rub all this in and then you let it set up and I'm gonna let it dry here while I'm finishing running the, the, this other screw home. What this wax does is it gets in and it nourishes an existing finish. We're not putting a new finish on with it. We're not trying to mimic a hundred years of hand oils like we were say on the Gewehr 91 or on a variety of other things that we've conserved in here. But this gun is stunning for something I'd never even seen before. This is stunning. So we'll just rub all this in. And, uh, and you can see in the before and afters, man, the difference. I mean, it just sits up there and pops. And this is why I beg people that want to send me stuff. God, don't help me. Don't cut straight to a wire wheel. Convert first. Wire wheel with something nice and smooth like we showed you. And you can pull back to this. This is what's hiding under there. Do the maintenance. I beg you. Yes, this is a 10 gauge weapon, but I wanna talk very, very quickly about why all of the Damascus barrel guns blew up in the 1960s. They blew up because they put the wrong ammunition in them. The ammunition manufacturers are not to blame. They said, use this ammunition only in guns that are suitable for it. The gun manufacturers weren't to blame because the weapons that they were putting smokeless roll or star crimp shells in were designed for black powder roll crimp shells. This is a standard 10 gauge, three and a half inch, three in three and three quarter dram, four dram, 10 gauge load. If we put this ammunition, which will physically mechanically fit in this gun in it, we will blow it to absolute kingdom come. So what I have done, and I've been very, very careful about it, is I've cut the top off of that round, dumped its original buckshot out, pulled the wad column out, and substituted a 12 gauge, two and three quarter dram load. So that's about 80 grains of black powder and around an ounce of shot. So I'm putting a 12 gauge load in a 10 gauge shotgun. We're gonna operate this gun. We are not gonna attempt to shoot it or do any really gross damage with it. In order to mark that, I, these are uh, roll crimped, where I made a spinner doodle that came down over the top of it, heated up the plastic and caved it into a little bit of hot glue. And then I annotated these primers by painting them black. So I've made several rounds of this. The rest of this ammunition is sequestered up the other end of my shop. There is no steel shot in this room. There is no steel shot in this entire shop because almost every gun I work on here dates back 
way back. And if you run steel shot and somebody's Damascus twist doubles, you'll blow the muzzles right off of them. So you have to be extremely careful what you feed these old girls. But if you feed them what they were intended to be fed, you should have far fewer issues. So what we got to do now is make sure this thing will stay locked shut. And then I'm going to borrow another rented shoulder here and let's see what we can come up with. I borrowed the shoulder of our international student to uh, absorb the recall because to be really honest guys, I'm getting really tired of getting the Terwillikers beat out of me. So we'll beat the crap out of him. Here we go. Do it again. Not bad. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. 1887 Winchester, and I'm glad I got this thing done because it was in here to be significantly modified for a customer, and um, this dude was scary, and he said he'd be back.